And so we've got this paper, um, and it really dives into this problem with large language models, you know, memory limitations, and especially when we're trying to deal with really long sequences. Yeah, it's a big challenge. Like, you know, analyzing a whole book instead of just a paragraph or two. Right, like expecting a calculator to run complex simulations or something. Exactly. The demand for these LLMs that can just handle these massive data sets is growing so fast, but... Yeah. The memory constraints are holding us back. It makes sense. I mean... Yeah, think about it. The longer the input, the larger those key value caches become during infants. So so what have people been doing so far to deal with this? I mean, there's got to be some workarounds, right? Well, there are. And existing solutions like sparse attention and off-chip storage try to manage this problem. Uh-huh. But they haven't been the ideal fix. Okay. They often introduce trade-offs like information loss or slower processing speeds. Yeah, it's like, you know, trying to fix a leaky faucet with duct tape. Exactly. You might temporarily stop the leak. Right. But it's not a sustainable solution. Exactly. So, okay, duct tape isn't the answer. No. What about this paper? It seems to be proposing something uh, something a little more elegant, right? Yeah, this paper, Tensor Product Attention is All You Need, presents this new attention mechanism okay. called Tensor Product Attention. The TPA. Or TPA, yeah. And it aims to achieve something remarkable boosting performance while using less memory. It sounds a little paradoxical. It does, right. How can something be more powerful and more efficient at the same time? It's like saying you can make a car faster and more fuel efficient right. just by tweaking the engine. Yeah, what's the magic trick here? The key lies in how TPA breaks down or factorizes the queries, keys, and values. Okay. It uses these tensor products to create smaller, more manageable components. Okay. And this factorization is also dynamic, meaning it adapts to each word based on its role in the input. Hold on, static versus dynamic. Yeah. So instead of treating every word the same way, it's like it's analyzing each word individually and figuring out the best way to represent Precisely. it. And this adaptability allows TPA to capture nuances that other methods might miss. Okay. It's like the difference between using a generic wrench versus a specialized tool for a specific task. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. But how does this dynamic factorization actually save memory? We're still dealing with the same amount of information, right? Right, but TPA changes how we store it. Okay. Instead of storing these entire massive matrices for queries, keys, and values, right. it only caches the smaller factorized components. Okay. And the paper claims this can lead to a 10x reduction in KV cache size. A tenfold reduction. Yeah. That's significant. Huge improvement. That's like saying you can reduce the size of a library by a factor of 10, and you could fit a lot more information in the same space. Exactly. And it has these huge implications for how we process and analyze large data sets. So are we talking about analyzing even larger texts, longer sequences than ever before? We are. TPA could be the key to unlocking the potential of LOMs to analyze these incredibly long and complex texts. Wow. Something that was previously considered computationally prohibitive. So this memory efficiency isn't the only trick up TPA sleeve. What else is there? Well, TPA doesn't just improve efficiency. It also offers a fresh perspective on existing attention mechanisms. Okay. The researchers found that familiar mechanisms like MHA, MQA, and even GQA can be viewed as specific, non-contextual variations of TPA. Wait, so TPA is like this umbrella term? In a way, yeah. And all these other attention mechanisms are just special cases of it. Yeah, it's an intriguing insight, isn't it? So we've been using these specialized tools without realizing they're all part of a larger toolkit. Yeah, TPA provides this unifying framework for understanding how all these mechanisms work. It's like discovering the underlying principle that connects all these seemingly disparate phenomena. Exactly. Wow, this is starting to feel like a significant shift in our understanding of attention mechanisms. Yeah. But how did they actually test this TPA thing? Did they build a whole new LLM from scratch? They did. They built a new LLM architecture called T6. Okay. It's based on the structure of popular LLMs like LMM, but it incorporates TPA for the attention part. Okay, so it's like upgrading the engine of a well-established car model to see how it performs with this new engine. Precisely. So they've got their new engine, the T6 model. Yeah. Now for the test trough, what kind of data set did they use to evaluate its performance? They trained T6 on the FineWeb Edo 100B data set. Okay. It's this massive collection of text designed to prepare LOMs for all sorts of different language tasks. Okay. And they also tested different model sizes, small, medium, and large. Makes sense. To see how TPA scaled with model size. And of course, they compared T6 against those baseline models using the standard attention mechanisms. All right. So we've got a new LLM, a massive data set, different model sizes. This is shaping up to be a pretty comprehensive evaluation. It is. 
But what about the results? Did TPA live up to the hype? The results are quite compelling. Okay. We'll dive into the specifics in the next part. Right. But I can tell you this TPA consistently demonstrated its ability to compete with and even surpass the established methods in several key areas. Sounds like we've got a lot more to unpack. We do. We'll be back after a short break to discuss the results and explore the broader implications of TPA. Picking up where we left off, right. let's look at these results and see how TPA actually performed. Yeah, you mentioned that it consistently matched or even outperformed those baseline models. Right. That's a bold claim. So what exactly were they measuring to make that assessment? Well, they used perplexity as one of their key metrics. Okay. Perplexity basically measures how well a language model predicts the next word in a sequence. Okay. So lower perplexity means better predictive ability. So like a test of how well the LLM understands the patterns and relationships between words? Yeah, you got it. Lower score means it kind of gets it. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And across the board, TPA, both the full version and its memory-saving variant, TPA cave only, right. achieved perplexity scores that were either on par with or better than those baseline models. Okay, so TPA checks out in terms of perplexity, but perplexity alone doesn't really tell the whole story, does it? No, it doesn't. How did it actually do in those real-world tasks? That's where it gets even more interesting. They evaluated T6, the LLM powered by TPA, on a whole suite of downstream tasks. Each designed to test different aspects of language, understanding, and generation. So things like question answering, common sense, reasoning, those multiple choice exams. Yeah. Tasks that require more than just predicting the next word. Exactly. And the remarkable thing is that both TPA and TPA K. Vonley consistently performed as well as or even better than those baseline models. Wow, across all those different tasks. Across those diverse tasks. So it's not just a one-track pony. It can handle a variety of these language-based challenges. That's right. What about TPA Kevani, that memory-saving variant? that You mentioned that stood out in some cases. How so? Yeah, so in the larger models, TPA Kevani sometimes even surpassed full TPA in terms of performance. Interesting. This suggests that for certain tasks, at least the memory savings don't necessarily come at the cost of accuracy or effectiveness. So potentially even more efficient without sacrificing performance. Right. That's a compelling argument for using PPA cave only in those larger models. Yeah. But hold on, let's back up a bit. You mentioned earlier that TPA offers this kind of fresh perspective on existing attention mechanisms. Yeah. Can we dig into that a little bit more? Sure. How does TPA actually relate to those other mechanisms like MHA, MQA, and GQA? Well, it's a matter of contextualization. Okay. TPA, with its dynamic factorization, right. can be seen as a generalized form of these other mechanisms. Okay. They can be viewed as special cases of GPA where the factorization is non-contextual. Okay. Meaning it's the same for every word. So TPA is like the parent and all these other attention mechanisms are like its children. Kind of, yeah. Think of it like a family tree. Okay. TPA is the ancestor, and these other mechanisms are its descendants, each inheriting certain traits. Okay. But also developing their own unique characteristics. So MHA, MQA, GQA, all part of the same family with TPA as the common ancestor. Exactly. It's like discovering that different species of animals are all descended from a single evolutionary lineage. Yeah, it's a good analogy. TPA provides that framework. Wow. For understanding how all these mechanisms relate to each other, and it opens up possibilities for exploring new variations and hybrids. So it's not just a new tool, it's a whole new way of thinking about attention mechanisms. That's right. That is pretty profound. It is. But before we get too philosophical, let's bring it back down to the practicality. Okay. We've talked about the results, the comparisons, the family tree, but were there any sort of haha -ha moments, any specific findings that really jumped out at you? One of the most intriguing findings was the effectiveness of TPAK only, especially in those larger models. Okay. This really suggests that we can achieve significant memory savings without compromising performance. At least for certain tasks. Right, and it challenges the assumption that bigger is always better when it comes to LLMs. It's like finding a way to make a supercomputer run on a laptop. Exactly. It could democratize access to these powerful technologies. Right. Making them available to a wider range of users and application. It could. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. TPA is still a relatively new development. It is. What are some of the limitations or areas where more research is needed? Well, while TPA shows great promise, it's important to remember that this is just one study. More research is needed to validate these findings, explore the limitations of TPA, and really determine its optimal use cases. So it's not like TPA is the ultimate solution to all our LLM woes. Right. But it's definitely a... Oh, wait. Someone wants to join. Hey, go for it. Hey there. How about the scaling of the TPA? Hey, it's great to... Oh, go for it. Hey, 
how about the scaling of the TPA? Hey, it's great to hear from you. Yeah, that's an important question you've brought up. So you're asking about the scaling of TPA? Right, how well it performs at different model sizes. We haven't really dug into that yet, have we? No, we haven't. The paper does touch on that, though. So they tested TPA on small, medium, and large models. Yeah, to see how it scales. And they found that it performed pretty well across the board. Consistently demonstrating its ability to compete with other models. That's pretty cool. It's not just a one-size-fits-all approach. Exactly. It's designed to scale with model size. And remember that TPA Kavani variant? The memory-saving version, yeah. It actually performed really well in those larger models. Sometimes surpassing even the full TPA implementation. It's pretty fascinating that we could save memory and not lose performance. Yeah, it challenges the idea that bigger is always better. But it's not like TPA is a perfect solution. Right. We were just saying that it's still a new thing. And that more research is definitely needed. Exactly. Things like figuring out the best ways to use it. One thing we're going to discuss next is how this dynamic factorization affects interpretability. Yeah, that's a really important question to ask about new tech. But before we dive into that, let's think about the bigger picture. Okay, let's shift our focus to the broader implications of TPA. Yeah, how could TPA potentially impact different fields and applications? We'll explore the potential of TPA to revolutionize scientific research and creative endeavors. All right, stay tuned. We're just getting to the good stuff. So we've covered the nitty-gritty details of TPA. Yeah, the memory savings, the performance gains, and how it fits in with other mechanisms. We did, but now I'm also curious about the bigger picture. Yeah, like what are the implications beyond more efficient LLMs? TPA isn't just an incremental improvement, it's a potential paradigm shift. It is, like we could actually use this in new and exciting ways. Exactly, it opens up all sorts of new possibilities. Okay, let's talk about that. So where do you think TPA could make a big difference? Well... The way I see it, yeah. it's not just about more efficient chatbots. No, it's way beyond that. It's about unlocking the potential of LLMs. Right, to do some pretty amazing things. We're reaching the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for all of your questions and insights. This has been a blast. We hope you learned something new today. We'll see you next time.